Good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome to tonight's uh, lecture of the Yukon Center for Judaic Studies by Professor Kevin Madison on reimagining Sinai and transforming the Torah and ancient Judaism. My name is Avi Noam Pat. I'm, I'm the director of the Center for Judaic Studies and Contemporary Jewish Life at the University of Connecticut. Before I introduce this evening's speaker, and we're all very much looking forward to hearing what Professor Madison has to share with us, I want to mention a couple of upcoming programs that uh, we have in the next few weeks here at, at UConn. Uh, these are both virtual programs over the next two weeks. Um, next Thursday, November 3rd, uh, we'll be hosting a virtual lecture with Professor Amy Weiss, who is uh, also teaching at the University of Connecticut this semester, and she'll be lecturing on passports for Palestine, forged travel documents and American volunteers in Israel's War of Independence. And that's next Thursday, November 3rd at 7 p.m. And then the following week on November 10th, uh, we'll have our annual Kristallnacht lecture uh, on uh, the evening of November 10th at 7.30 p.m. And that will be featuring Daniel Green, who will be uh, speaking on Americans and the Holocaust. And some of you might be familiar with uh, Danny Green, who was featured in the recent Ken Burns uh, documentary on the US and the Holocaust. So that is on November 10th. And um, Sierra, uh, thank you, Sierra is dropping uh, registration links into uh, the chat. So um, we're really uh, delighted to be able to welcome uh, Kevin Madison, uh, both to the University of Connecticut, where he is uh, teaching this year uh, a number of courses for us, which uh, by all accounts are going extremely well. And we're also uh, really looking forward to learning more about um, his research in his forthcoming book. Um, you'll notice that for those of you who have just joined uh, the program, that we have set this up so that um, you are muted upon entry into the program. Um, but when we get to the Q&A uh, at the end of the program, we'll allow participants to unmute themselves, but this way this will minimize disruptions during the program. If you have questions for our speaker during the uh, lecture, you can always type those into the chat and then we'll know to come back to you uh, for your questions uh, when Kevin is done uh, with, with his lecture. So Kevin uh, Madison uh, in the 2022-2023 academic year is serving as adjunct assistant professor of Hebrew and Judaic studies at the University of Connecticut where he's teaching courses in Judaism and Bible. He earned his PhD in classical and ancient Near East studies with the Hebrew Bible focus at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2017. He earned a BA in Bible and Ancient Near East from Brandeis University in 2009 and completed his BA in Religious Studies and Jewish Studies at the University of Minnesota before that. He has previously taught courses at High Point University and at the University of Wisconsin and in 2019 was a research associate at Ruhr Universität Bochum, uh, where he worked on inner biblical interpretation and in the narrative texts of the Pentateuch. His previous publications, including his first book, Rewriting and Revision as Amendment in the Laws of Deuteronomy, uh, was published in 2019 and uh, 18, excuse me, and it focused on interpretive revision of religious law within the Torah itself. His current book project, Transforming the Torah, Reimagining Israel's Origins in Ancient Judaism, examines the variety of retellings of the Torah that proliferated in the Second Temple period and is the focus of tonight's lecture. So without further ado, uh, it gives me great pleasure to turn the screen over, as it were, to Professor Kevin Madison. Over to you. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. Um, and I, I want to thank um, Avi and Sierra for setting up uh, tonight's lecture and the um, Center for Judaic Studies and Contemporary Jewish Life for sponsoring it. Um, and I want to thank all of you for being here. Um, I'm going to be uh, talking with you for about the next half an hour, and then we'll have, uh, we should have plenty of time at the end um, for any questions. Uh, so today I'm going to be uh, taking you through some um, sophisticated ancient uh, conceptualizations of what exactly happened at Mount Sinai. Um, uh, before we do that, um, because I couldn't help myself, I want to show you a uh, rather more recent and less sophisticated reimagining of Sinai that I came across in preparing for uh, today's lecture. Um, so here is 
Sinai as reimagined by Microsoft PowerPoint. Um, and um, I guess they decided that um, a strange conversation between Joshua and an angel that somehow leaves Moses out. Um, not the best take on Sinai, and I think you'll agree that when we go through all of these ancient versions, uh, those those are a little bit better. And I think um, also this gives us some reassurance that we're probably safe from the rise of artificial intelligence, um, at least for now. Um, so, so with that in mind, um, I want to turn uh, first to um, the Torah's accounts of what happened at Sinai and then uh, some others that we see cropping up in ancient times. So the Torah or the Pentateuch tells the story of ancient Israel's origin. But as readers have recognized since ancient times, the way that story is told is anything but straightforward. The complexity of the Torah is evident from the very beginning. It begins in Genesis with not one, but two distinct accounts of the creation of the world. <clears throat> in the first account, an unnamed God systematically and effortlessly speaks the world into being over the course of six days, which culminate in the creation of humanity as divinely blessed overseers of all creation. Each day's creation is characterized as good, and now that it, that it is complete, it is very good. Everything has gone smoothly, and God establishes the Sabbath to commemorate the completion of his work. In the second story, a God who is named Yahweh first creates man, but not woman, by molding, not by speaking, to work, not to rule. He then creates animals, and finally woman, in a series of reactive attempts to solve problems in his divine garden. Rather than blessing the first humans, this God impo imposes limitations on them, which they soon break, resulting in their banishment from the garden, lest they ascend to godhood. In this second story, everything is not good. These stories do not simply relate a single conception of creation from two different angles or differing details that convey the same basic message. They disagree about the nature of God, the nature of humanity, and how humanity relates both to God and to the rest of creation. And that's only the first three chapters. The juxtaposition of drastically different viewpoints, not just minor differences in detail, but fundamentally distinct worldviews, continues throughout the Torah. Still more perspectives on Israel's origin story proliferated in ancient Judaism, as communities sought to connect the most pressing issues of their present to the foundational moments of their past. This is especially true for the Israelites' encounter with their God at Sinai. As we'll see today, ancient Jewish communities showed a special interest and a wide variety of methods in anchoring their most valued ideals and practices in the Sinai encounter. The versions of the Sinai story that most closely resemble the Sinai of popular consciousness, featuring the Ten Commandments, the stone tablets, and the golden calf, are technically not about Sinai at all, but about a mountain called Horeb. We'll now turn to two versions of the Horeb story preserved in the Torah, an older version in the book of Exodus, and a retelling of that story found in Deuteronomy. The Horeb revelation of Exodus includes two bodies of divine law, the Ten Commandments, also called the Decalogue, and a longer covenant code. These two sets of laws play distinct roles in the story. The Ten Commandments, though legal in form, serve as a prophetic sign. The Ten Commandments set the stage for the private revelation of the covenant code to Moses, both by establishing Moses' legitimacy as an intermediary and by convincing the Israelites that they are not entitled to and do not want further direct communication from God. Within Exodus, the covenant code forms the legal basis for the Horeb covenant. This covenant is affirmed in multiple steps, each of which escalates the authority and permanence of the covenant. An oral agreement between Moses and the Israelites gives way to a more formal process, including Moses writing a scroll and a sacrificial covenant ceremony. The process culminates in God's inscription of the laws on stone tablets. This second use of writing, the more permanent medium of stone, and the direct involvement of God all lend additional legitimacy, authority, and permanence to the covenant and its legal terms. 
the laws spoken by God to Moses told the Israelites the terms of the covenant, how they were to act in the land that they would soon occupy, and how to interact with God. The first commands of this covenant code tell the Israelites how their God wants to be worshipped, not with ornate gold or silver statues, but with a simple altar of dirt or unworked stone. Such altars are to be constructed and used in every place where I cause my name to be remembered. And at such altars, well-being offerings and whole burnt offerings are to be sacrificed. <clears throat> and that's it. It's that simple. Readers familiar with the stories of Israel's ancestors in Genesis and of Israel's life in the land will recognize here the pattern of divine encounters and other significant events that led to a landscape dotted with altar. The simplicity of the sacrificial system envisaged here, as well as the simplicity and multiplicity of altars, run counter to other depictions of the foundational divine instructions given at Sinai or Horeb, and bear little resemblance to the elaborate sacrificial system later centered on the Jerusalem temple. According to Exodus, the law revealed to Moses after the Ten Commandments served as the basis of the Horeb Covenant and was written on the stone tablets. The Ten Commandments themselves were never written down and never explicitly accepted by the Israelites as binding. If this depiction comes as a surprise, it's because Deuteronomy has forcefully and successfully reimagined the Horeb experience. Deuteronomy's version of the Horeb experience is presented not as a narration of those events in Exodus, but as Moses' recollections of those events in a final series of speeches to the Israelites before Moses dies and the Israelites enter the promised land without him. Deuteronomy's self-presentation as the final words of Moses facilitated the reading of Deuteronomy back into Exodus, and many interpreters did exactly this. We'll see some important examples of this phenomenon today, going back over 2,000 years. Deuteronomy utilizes several interpretive opportunities latent in the Exodus, in the Exodus Horeb narrative. As we've seen in Exodus, the covenant, the Ten Commandments have a legal form but lack a legal function. And the contents of the stone tablets um, are assumed to be the covenant code but not stated explicitly. Deuteronomy claims that the people did in fact recognize the legal force of the Ten Commandments and did assent to them as covenant terms. From this claim, Deuteronomy proceeds to substitute the Ten Commandments for the covenant code as the basis of the covenant at Horeb and as the document written by God on the stone tablets. In this version of, of events, the Israelites do not assent to the main body of laws that was revealed to Moses at Horeb, but only after Moses had expounded on the law throughout Deuteronomy. As a result, later Israelites are bound not by the covenant code recorded in Exodus, but by the reworking of those laws presented in Deuteronomy. A key point of Deuteronomy's revisionist retelling of the law is the claim that God instructed the Israelites to worship him in only one place. In Exodus, God told the Israelites to worship at many sites, every place where God chooses where God chooses to have his name be remembered. According to Deuteronomy, the Israelite God wants to be worshipped only in the place that he has chosen or will choose. And we'll return in a few minutes to whether God has chosen or will choose the place. Um, ancient readers disagreed on this point. By reimagining the Horeb story, Deuteronomy effectively claimed that God has always wanted centralized worship. In the priestly version of Israel's origin story, also preserved within the Pentateuch, the Divine Mountain is called by the more familiar name of Sinai, but its importance is drastically reduced. No covenant is made there, and no laws are given. Even the priestly depiction of the call of Moses is set not at the mountain of God, but in Egypt. In the priestly story, Moses ascends Sinai only to re receive instructions for how to build the tabernacle. And the completed tabernacle eclipses Sinai as the, the true locus of revelation. 
Indeed, God tells Moses that at the completed tabernacle, he will reveal to Moses all my commands for the Israelites. This statement with the qualifier all sits uneasily in the composite text of Exodus, in which, as we've seen, God has already transmitted the Ten Commandments to all Israel and the covenant code to Moses. This tension tells us something important about the priestly account of Israel's origins. It denies that any law was given on the mountain, rejecting the central claim of the two Horeb accounts found in Exodus and Deuteronomy. Once Moses has received and relayed the instructions for building the tabernacle, the Israelites proceed with its construction. The tabernacle is erected not on Sinai, but at Sinai. This distinction is important for two related reasons. First, whereas the mountain revelation paradigm required Moses to leave the people and go to God, the tabernacle allows God to come to the Israelites. The central goal of the priestly story is to make it possible for Yahweh to dwell in the midst of his people. Second, when the Israelites leave the mountain, God goes with them, and revelation can and does continue throughout the wilderness journey. Sacrifice at the priestly tabernacle was drastically different from the simple sacrificial system that the covenant code had located at various altars and Deuteronomy had located in one chosen place. The sacrificial altar itself is much more elaborate. Rather than simple piled up earth or stones, we have a highly manufactured altar built out of acacia wood, plated with bronze and equipped with horns, grating, a ledge, and poles. The location of this altar is also distinct. It's not simply to be built in one or more divinely chosen locations, but in the courtyard of the mobile tabernacle complex. The highly elaborate priestly tabernacle, which is described in great detail, uses increasing ornateness to convey increasing sacredness. The tabernacle complex consists of a courtyard, which contains the sacrificial altar, a tent, which includes a golden incense altar and other paraphernalia, and an inner shrine within the tent, which contains the golden ark and cherubim. As one moves inward, bronze and silver give way to gold and plain linen to bold blue and purple dyes. The value of materials and the intricacy of their manufacture conveys increasing holiness. But we as readers are privileged in our ability to tour the tabernacle. In reality, one cannot move inward. Only the courtyard is accessible to lay Israelites. And even to enter this far, they must be ritually pure. The tent is accessible only to priests, and the inner sanctum is for God. The successive restrictions enforced by rules and by physical barriers further emphasize that each threshold crossed entails an increase in the holiness of the space within. The priestly system of sacrifice further emphasizes this system of increasing sanctity and protects it. Leviticus chapters 1 through 7 describe a sacrificial system that, like the priestly sanctuary, is both more complex and more fully described than those of the covenant code of Exodus and Deuteronomy. The most important addition to our familiar repertoire of burnt offerings and well-being offerings are the purification or sin offerings. In the priestly conception, sins committed by the Israelites and impurities they contract can defile the sanctuary. To maintain the, the purity of God's dwelling place within the sanctuary, thereby ensuring his continued presence in the midst of his people, special offerings must be made to negate each sin and impurity. But these offerings could, not, could only purify the courtyard and the outer portion of the tent. Once a year, special day of purgation procedures allowed the high priest to cleanse the inner sanctum, thereby ensuring complete purification of the sanctuary. The intricacies of this system of sacrifice and purification and the concomitant need of priestly supervision at the priestly tabernacle meant 
that sacrifice prior to this time was impossible. For this reason, the priestly story lacked any account of sacrifices made by Cain and Abel, Noah, or Israel's ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This unique viewpoint was obscured for all future readers when it was incorporated into the Torah alongside other stories in which those early figures could and did offer sacrifices. The author of the Book of Jubilees reimagined Israel's origin story about 2,200 years ago. By this time, the Torah had been compiled, bringing together multiple depictions of Israel's origins, including those we've just seen. Jubilees created still another version of Israel's origin story to resolve problems in the now combined Torah and to bridge gaps between the Pentateuch and the needs of Jubilees' audience. Jubilees presents itself as a revelation to Moses during his 40-day sojourn on Mount Sinai. Jubilees seems to have reasoned that God and Moses would have used their time together wisely. This was a unique revelatory opportunity, and one that came at a great cost. While Moses lingered on the mountain for 40 days, the Israelites built the golden calf, breaking their newly cut covenant and nearly ending their life in the land before it began. By quoting extensively from Exodus 24, Jubilees 1 argues that God did make the most of this time, using it to reveal to Moses a wealth of information about earlier ages. Thanks to Jubilees' unique setting, its revelation did not replace the Pentateuch or the legal revelations it contained. An additional precaution ensured that the two revelations would remain distinct. God did not convey Jubilees to Moses directly, as he had with the laws in Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, but dispatched an angel of the presence to dictate this revelation to Moses. This second Sinai revelation made a cumulative argument that the Sinai laws were not arbitrary or parochial, imposed by a national god only on his own people, seemingly out of nowhere. Instead, they were a codification of angelic, cosmic, and primeval reality. The angel of the presence starts his account of history, like the book of Genesis, with creation. In Jubilee's retelling of creation, we see several important tendencies that continue through the rest of Jubilee's. The harmonization of discrepancies in the Pentateuch, the anchoring of Mosaic law in creation, human, human beginnings, and heavenly realities, and the correction of claims in the Torah that the author found theologically troubling. Jubilees harmonized and conflated the Torah's two stories of creation by incorporating the planting of the Garden of Eden from Genesis 2 into the third day creation of trees in Genesis 1, and by de depicting the sequence of events in Eden as a second week of creation on the model of Genesis 1. The author aligned the creation stories with his own theological vision by elevating the Sabbath to the status of angelic practice and tying it to God's choosing of Israel, and by denying that God designed the moon to play a calendrical role, effectively arguing that the author's preferred solar calendar had a cosmic basis that competing lunar calendars lacked. Jubilees used the creation stories to provide precedence for Jewish law, finding in the Eden story's sequential creation, first of man and then woman, a basis for the laws of post-childbirth impurity found in Leviticus, and depicting Adam as offering the morning incense that priests would later offer at the tabernacle and temple. This is the first of many instances in which Jubilees depicts early humans as sacrificing in accordance with and anticipation of later Sinaitic law. So we see Enoch, offering evening incense, Noah celebrating Shavuot, or the Festival of Weeks, and um, Abraham celebrating Sukkot, or the Festival of Booths. Like Jubilees, the Temple Scroll was written just over 2,000 years ago, in a world in which the Torah now existed as a compiled whole, and was in some sense important, but also self-contradictory and dated. The Temple Scroll 
sought to solve these problems by harmonizing and consolidating the laws scattered throughout the Torah and updating them to speak to contemporary needs and the author's own ideals. To harmonize the Torah with itself and with the author's own theological vision, the Temple Scroll created a Sinai revelation of unprecedented scale, co-opting the setting of Exodus 34, Moses' second 40-day stint on Sinai. This allowed the Temple Scroll to present itself as Sinai revelation without competing with or replacing the revelations in the Pentateuch. Like the Covenant Code and Jubilees, the Temple Scroll was another of a series of revelations that filled Moses' treks up Mount Sinai. Much of the content of the Temple Scroll is drawn from the Pentateuch. Tabernacle instructions are recast as temple instructions, and this fills an important gap between the Pentateuch and ancient Jewish practice. The temple was central to Jewish practice, yet the Torah contained no command to build a temple, much less instructions for how to build and use it. In addition, the temple scroll relocated laws from Leviticus and Numbers from the priestly tabernacle to the mountain and revoiced laws of Deuteronomy as divine rather than mosaic speech. This recasting of Pentateuchal law harmonized Deuteronomic, priestly, and other laws found throughout the Torah. It also provided Deuteronomy's mosaic laws with a divine precedent that Deuteronomy claims for them, but that had little basis in Exodus. Additional inspiration for the temple instructions in the temple scroll was drawn from depictions of Solomon's temple and the second temple, as well as Ezekiel's temple vision. To a certain extent, this had the effect of providing a Sinaitic pedigree to Solomon's temple, as well as the second temple. At the same time, the temple described in the temple scroll goes far beyond any real Israelite or Jewish temple in scale and in purity protections. And um, this temple complex is as massive as it looks. It would have taken up basically the entire city of Jerusalem uh, at the time. Ultimately, the Temple Scroll does not endorse either temple, but indicts both as falling far short of the divine design mandated at Sinai. The two major Hebrew versions of the Pentateuch that exist to the present day are the Masoretic text, the, which is the main Jewish text of the Pentateuch, and the Samaritan Pentateuch. Both traditions go back to medieval manuscripts that ultimately have their roots in ancient Judaism. Much like the accounts of Israel's origins that we've already examined within parts of the Pentateuch and beyond it in texts like Jubilees and the Temple Scroll, these versions of the Pentateuch anchor their own unique and sometimes mutually exclusive claims in the Sinai encounter. The Samaritan Pentateuch harmonizes various parts of the Pentateuch by copying material from one context into a parallel context that lacks the material, most often taking materials from the speech, speeches of Moses in Deuteronomy and copying that into parallel events in Exodus and Numbers. An important example of this phenomenon is the Samaritan retelling of Exodus 20, which includes part of the Sinai Horeb encounter, the Ten Commandments, and the opening verses of the Covenant Code. We've already seen that Jubilees in the Temple Scroll recognized unique revelatory opportunities in Moses' two 40-day sojourns on the Divine Mountain. The Samaritan Pentateuch takes this reasoning one step further and sets its sights on the one and only occasion on which, <clears throat> excuse me, on which God re revealed the law directly to the Israelites, the Ten Commandments. Because the people respond with fear and ref refuse to receive further divine revelation, any further law giving is mediated through Moses. The Samaritan Pentateuch includes after the Ten Commandments, but before the people's terrified response, an additional law known as the Gerizim Commandment. This law requires that the Israelites construct an altar on Mount Gerizim, which just so happens to be the location of the later Samaritan sanctuary. By inserting this command into the single direct divine speech to the Israelites, 
A Samaritan Pentateuch claims for worship at Gerizim an authority and authenticity perhaps even greater than that of the laws mediated through Moses. The Samaritan Pentateuch reinforces the divine command to worship at Mount Gerizim by adjusting the altar law later in Exodus 20 to coordinate it with the added command. As we have seen, the altar law in Exodus 20 refers to the construction of many altars at places that God will designate during Israel's future life in the, in the land, every place where it caused many to be remembered. Not so in the Samaritan version of the verse, which removes the word every, thus referring to a single place, and changes the future tense for past, indicating that God has already marked his single place of worship. Through these two small changes, the altar law now points back to the Gerizim commandment. The text of the Pentateuch that would become the Masoretic text created an exclusively Jewish Pentateuch, in part by minimizing the pro-Gerizim sentiments found in the Pentateuch. Rather than change the Sinai revelation directly, as the Samaritan Pentateuch did, uh, this Pentateuch altered the recollections of Moses in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 27 contains positive references to Mount Gerizim. The Masoretic text preserves an ancient attempt to neutralize this reference by swapping out Gerizim in favor of Mount Ebal, which also features in the ceremonies of Deuteronomy 27, but was less problematic because it was not the site of the later Samaritan sanctuary. Another important difference between the Masoretic and Samaritan versions of Deuteronomy is in the formulation of references to God's chosen place. The Masoretic text refers to a place that God will choose, whereas the Samaritan text speaks of a place that God has chosen. It was long thought that the Masoretic formulation was more original and that the Samaritans introduced a past tense verb to further bolster their claims that God had already chosen Gerizim in the time of Moses or even earlier in the time of their ancestors. This view, however, is based on a larger assumption of the primacy of the Masoretic text and the secondariness of the Samaritan text. An unbiased analysis of the textual evidence, including also Greek witnesses and the Dead Sea Scrolls, suggests that the Samaritan reading was earlier. Hence, the change of references to a place that God has chosen to one that he will choose was employed much like the swapping of Mount Ebal and Gerizim to undermine Samaritan claims to a Sinaitic pedigree for their site of worship. Moreover, this forward-looking formulation better accorded with descriptions of Jerusalem in Jewish scriptures. The books of Samuel and Kings, which are included in Jewish but not Samaritan scripture, suggest that God chose Jerusalem long after the time of Moses, when David conquered the city and Solomon built the temple there. The variant texts of the Pentateuch that would become the Samaritan and Masoretic Pentateuchs reimagined the foundational divine laws given at Sinai in ways that were formally more subtle than the other examples we've seen, but ideologically no less powerful. Ancient Jewish reimaginings of Sinai transcend later canonical and scholarly categories. Some would become canonical for Jews, Samaritans, some or all Christians, or none of the above. Scholars would come to categorize them variously as belonging to the composition, reception, or transmission of the Pentateuch. By comparing these across boundaries that only emerged later, we can peer deeper into the past and glimpse the vitality of ancient Jewish literature. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Kevin. Um, yes, and uh, you can see here an upcoming article on this topic at thetorah.com. Um, so uh, thank you for, for sharing your, your research with us, Kevin, and uh, the topic of your forthcoming book project. Um, as, I, as I indicated before, we'd love to have uh, folks uh, ask questions if you can indicate that you have a question for Kevin through the chat, or you can always use the hand raise um, function. 
maybe for now, Kevin, so we can see people will take the uh, the screen share down yes. um, for now so we can see sort of the gallery view of, of who's here at least get a sense for uh, that we're all together in the same in the same place. Um, so I'll, I'll start with a first question um, while uh, folks are formulating their questions. Um, and uh, I, I should note that you know it's it's interesting that the timing of uh, of your lecture. So we we just completed uh, last week the um, uh, cycle of of the Jewish holidays and uh, with the holiday of Simchat Torah, the celebration of the of the Torah, the conclusion of the annual cycle of the reading of the Torah and the beginning again of uh, um, from uh, starting with Breshit or the beginning of Genesis. So. Um, it was not coincidental that we decided to schedule your lecture now at this time when we're thinking about um, sort of the, the annual cycle of, of the reading of the Torah. But I, I am curious, and perhaps you can say a little bit more about um, what what this sort of telling and, and retelling of uh, the, the Sinai story, how much that has to do with interactions with other ancient religions and other ancient religious traditions, and um, to what extent you see this interplay taking place in the sort of evolution, um, composition, reception, retelling through this, uh, the interactions with, with other uh, religious traditions? Uh, yeah, thank you. That's, that's uh, a great question. Um, and uh, the uh, relatively short answer is, is that um, we definitely can see um, that these authors, as they're th rethinking uh, what happened at Sinai? They are they are being influenced, and they're in conversation with um, what other groups around them are doing. And and so uh, to give just a couple of um, relatively uh, well known and and relatively straightforward examples. Um, so um, Deuteronomy seems to envision the Sinai, or it calls the Horeb covenant, as a vassal treaty with. Um, the Israelite God as overlord and the people as his vassal. And it's modeled very closely on the treaties of the Assyrian Empire that was uh, running roughshod over Israel and Judah and much of the ancient world at the time. And so they're definitely thinking about, um, and um, th there's the possibility that Deuteronomy is being sort of uh, politically subversive and, and is saying our overlord is not um, Esarhaddon or Ashurbanipal or some Assyrian king, but our divine king, our God. Um, and so that's definitely um, in play. And then in a later time, uh, we talked also about Jubilees today. Um, in Jubilees, we see Jubilees is a, living in a, uh, a Greco-Roman world, um, which is a lot has changed since the sort of more ancient Near Eastern world that um, a lot of the Torah was written in. And so one big change that that we can see is Jubilees is rethinking circumcision. And circumcision is in the Torah, but is not nearly as central and pervasive as it becomes in later times. Um, and it's something that is seen, um, there's a reason that circumcision is traced in Genesis back to Abraham, because it's seen as this larger cultural practice. But by the time of Jubilees, it's not. It's a unique identifier. It's something that um, Jews are doing and their um, their neighbors are not doing. And so it becomes this um, much more exclusive uh, trait and, and sort of a, a boundary marker between um, Jews and other communities. And so in Jubilees, we see um, something we don't see in the Pentateuch, which is circumcision is no longer just an individual requirement for being a part of the group. It's now a collective requirement for group survival. And to fail to circumcise as a group is to risk a uh, group destruction, which is something new. Avi, you're muted. Thank you, Sierra. Um, <laughs> Always, there's always somebody who does that. So, um, thank you so much, Kevin. So, um, please feel free to, uh, you know, uh, you can use the hand raise function, or let us know if you have a question for for Kevin, and I'll um, enable you to uh, to unmute yourself um, to ask uh, further further questions. Um, so, I am I am intrigued, Kevin, by this idea of um, sort of. Uh, 
portable holiness uh, that you that you uh, very nicely illustrated with the uh, animated form in the in the PowerPoint um, mm -hmm. presentation. Um, can you can you tell us a little bit more about sort of the the importance of these these different sites and trying to identify the specific location of where Sinai is or where Sinai might have been and why that does not become sort of a, a more important feature of, of the religion, right? Because you could imagine that this could yeah. um, become a, a, you know, a central pilgrimage site um, and yet specifically it, it really does not. So um, why is that? And why are we still left with, you know, there's different, uh, theories as to um, where that, you know, the, uh, the revelation took place and where Sinai is. Why, why does it evolve in this way that we don't uh, know exactly where the site is? Yeah. Um, so uh, the confusion there starts very early, right? And even in in the Book of Exodus, uh, there are two different names for it, um, and those are not just uh synonyms necessarily although uh at a certain point they sort of have they're forced to become synonyms but uh probably mount horeb and mount sinai uh, there's no reason to think that these even refer to the same mountain um and so um there's already um sort of built into the pentateuch there is this discrepancy about what happened at um this divine mountain where is the Israelites met their God and what mountain was it? Where, where did this happen? Um, and, um, and then there are even, there's even, um, I mentioned in this, this priestly version, there's this kind of downplaying of um, the importance of the mountain. And uh, so when God wants to commission Moses to become his, the, the leader and get the Israelites out of Egypt, Moses doesn't have to flee into the wilderness to find God. God goes to Egypt to meet him. Um, and that's the first indication of this kind of priestly conception that God is not in a certain place. He's in the midst of his people. That's where he wants to be. And so he can kind of stop by to talk to Moses, but to be fully and permanently present, he needs this special sanctuary with all these protections. Um, and um, so there's already in that priestly story, there is this uh, almost lack of concern with um, where this all happened. The location is not important. And I think that um, historically, there's a reason that the this the location becomes less of an important question than it might be. Um, and that happens, we can see that happening in real time in the book of Ezekiel, um, because Ezekiel tells us exactly when and where he is, and he's living in the Babylonian exile. He had been working in the temple in Jerusalem, which many people thought and, and of course still think was God's chosen place. Um, he can't get there. He can't do his job as a priest of mediating between uh, God and uh, his people, or so he thinks. Um, he has this chariot vision that essentially seems to convince Ezekiel and maybe is designed to convince his audience that God is not anchored or tied to a specific place. He belongs in the midst of his people. And um, and um, with that comes the power to be with them even when they're in exile and ultimately the power to, um, to bring them back from this national death um, uh, that, that exile is. Um, so I think there um, we can start to see the, the seeds of this idea that um, God's location is not an absolute geographic location, but he belongs in uh, where his people are. Interesting, yeah, thank you. Um, so I see we have a, a question that's come in here um, through the chat from uh, Rally, one of the one of our participants of our Yiddish Tish, which we'll be resuming again soon um, uh, in in the next uh, in the beginning of November. Um, so Rally asks, um, can you talk about the Ark of the Covenant? Uh, how many descriptions of the Ark are there, and how does it compare to other cultures? And it is it is interesting, you know, um, you reference sort of uh, popular culture. Um, Charlton Heston and, and uh, the Ten Commandments, but of course there's also you know other. Uh, I'm sure people are familiar with the Raiders of the Lost Ark and sort of this uh, popular imagination of of what the Ark um, looked like. But um, can you talk about the Ark of the Covenant and um, you know how, how does that compare and how do the 
the very specific and intricate details of what the arc looks like, how does that change um, and compare to to other cultures? Yeah. Um, so that so that's um, the, the the arc is no exception to this. Um, what we've been talking about that there are different uh, depictions and different conceptions of all of these key um, concepts. And so we have in the in the priestly tabernacle there is an arc, and that arc sits in the inner sanctum in the holy of holies. And so it's at the very center of all of these protections and all of these increasing um, gradations of holiness. And so that's that uh, in that location, it's gold, it's plated with gold inside and out. And so it's just gold on gold. And, and so this signifies the holiness. Um, and the ark uh, there is essentially, um, this is uh, where, this is where God sits. Um, and so it's sort of a divine throne within his inner chamber in his, uh, his throne room inside this, this sanctuary. Um, and then there is a very different depiction of the Ark in the book of Deuteronomy, where it's just kind of um, a box. And again, Deuteronomy is is pretty sparse with description. It doesn't even uh, tell us, it doesn't tell us much about how to build an altar or how to do sacrifice. And, and the same thing here, um, but it's it's a box and it's there for um, just for storing the tablets. It's not this divine throne. Um, and then moving beyond the Pentateuch, um, the um, the Ark uh, doesn't just sit in darkness inside the inner sanctum, but actually um, can accompany the Israelites in battle. And um, so it has. So so there are different roles here. And that that last one is um, something that that we definitely see in uh, um, in other cultures. The idea that a um, a people's god or gods will accompany them in battle. Um, that's something that we can see in other cultures. Um, in terms of the the, the priestly uh, depiction, um, essentially what we have is we have this golden ark with golden cherubim on it, and we have the idea of an invisible deity sitting on top. Instead of in the inner sanctum of other gods, you would expect a statue that kind of embodies the deity. So there's that same, this is where God dwells, that's a parallel, but what's different is the lack of a um, of a statue that represents God himself. Yeah, it's it's really interesting, right? Because it, it can't be an idol, but it's it's sort yes. of a, an evolution from that. Um, yes, an and the yeah, 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 exactly. And the 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 golden calf, which we also talked about a little bit today, uh, the golden calf is depicted um, in the book of Exodus as a statue of, of the Israelite God. And so when Aaron builds it, he said let's have a festival for Yahweh. It's not, this is not some other deity. And so the idea that the golden calf is um, Israel's original sin, so to speak, uh, that comes from the idea that uh, number one, you shouldn't represent God directly. And number two, um, this alternative version where you have these cherubim, um, that's the only acceptable kind of uh, iconography that belongs in um in God's throne room. Great. Um, so uh, we, I see we, we have here our uh, distinguished professor Stuart Miller, who just uh, recently uh, retired uh, now is, is now uh, professor emeritus. Um, and in, in the spring of 2023, we'll be having a, a formal program, a scholarly colloquium uh, to celebrate uh, all of Stuart's uh, wonderful contributions over many years to the University of Connecticut. But um, I'd love to give Stuart an opportunity to, to ask you a question. So Stuart, I'm gonna hand it over to you. So uh, thank you, Avi, and hello to everybody. Um, uh, and thank you, Kevin, for a lucid presentation of a pretty complex subject. Um, I think um, I have more comments than, than really questions, but mm -hmm. comments that maybe you can expand upon. I think for some uh, of the listeners today, uh, this is all new to them, the kinds of contradictions that exist in biblical traditions, um, contradictions that uh, religionists don't see uh, because they've been harmonized away by the tradition. There are all sorts of answers to these issues. Um, and yet, uh, when we get to the period you're talking about, we talk about Jubilees and Dead Sea Scrolls, we're talking about the last couple of centuries 
two, three centuries or so, roughly the Hellenistic to, uh, to the early Roman period, um, which corresponds with the late Second Temple period. And there's so much going on during that period. Of course, I'm going to make that case because that's the period of my specialization. But, but there really is. And there's this whole fermentation uh, that maybe you want to talk a little bit more about. I'm not sure people realize that at Qumran itself, that we're reading Jubilees uh, in Hebrew before we before we 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 had such a text, and you know it was an Ethiopic uh, uh, up to a certain point that that scholars uh, were familiar with uh, with that with uh, with Jubilees, which um, is kind of a pseudepigrapha or a, now consider more of an apocryphal text. Uh, so you have a proto-Masoretic text um, tradition. You have a, some some Samaritan traditions, I believe, and some and certainly Septuagint traditions, all living side by side uh, amongst the the Qumranites. And the only other point I want to make is to come back to the Hellenistic period. This is a period in which uh, sorting things out is, to my mind, really what's going on. People are. Uh, defining themselves, um, identity um, is, I've used this word over and over again, my students know it well, complex. Um, we tend to look at it as a period in which there are Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, and Dead Sea sectarians, and also and Samaritans, of course, uh, eventually early Christians. Uh, the truth is, this is one big muddle. And so that you would have all these different traditions uh, is really no surprise because there's a, there's there's um, there's so much of this fermentation going on at this point in time. And I'll leave it at that. I have a few more thoughts, but I'll stop. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you, Stuart. Um, and I would love love to hear your, the rest of your thoughts later, maybe too. Yeah. Um, um, I appreciate it. So, um, and you did cut out. I don't know if I have something wrong with my internet here, but you cut out a couple of times. But I think I um, I, uh, I know what you're getting at. Um, so, uh, first of all, uh, all of these uh, texts that I that um, I talked about, um, all of this variety and much more, right, has has been found among the Dead Sea Scrolls, and so we know that this at least this one ancient Jewish community that um, compiled these scrolls used them. Um, they were looking at these uh, different versions of Israel's origin story found in, in, in the Pentateuch, but also the version found in Jubilees, the version found in the Temple Scroll. Um, there are others um, that I didn't talk about today because they don't deal with Sinai specifically, um, but there's an even longer list. And, and, and um, they, um, you know, we, we don't know exactly what they, they did with them uh, because we don't have, for example, for certain books, we have these um, we have an, uh, these line by line interpretations, and we we can see them in action. Um, for example, applying prophecy to their own time in this kind of apocalyptic way. It's very similar to what the Jesus movement would do a little bit later. Um, with these different versions of Israel's origin story, we know that they kept them. Basically, we, they had different versions of Genesis, different versions of Exodus, um, and so on, and they had this whole uh, kind of uh, library of different um, versions. And um, so it looks like they hadn't decided on one definitive text of the Torah or of any books of the Hebrew Bible. Um, and it also looks like they, uh, even which, which books are included, which books are uh, scripture, if that's even the right term to use, which which books are authoritative and indispensable uh, for um, what uh, who we are and how we fit in our world, um, that seems to have been um, up in the air. And even though this this group has sequestered themselves out by the Dead Sea, um, and in certain ways they seem um, like they might not be typical Second Temple uh, Jews um, because they've purposely tried to get away from the rest of uh, the, the, the population um, living in places like Jerusalem. Uh, but in terms of that uh, literary flux and the lack of, you know, the dust has not settled, I think that's um, very much in line with what's going on um, at the time. 
Um, and um, I'm, I'm also interested in, um, you, you were talking about the complex identity of people at this time. There are, uh, have been many attempts uh, because we have so much information about this one group that lived out by the Dead Sea. Were they Essenes? Were they Sadducees? Um, do they fit in any of the boxes that we know about from Josephus or other <laughs> sources? Um, that's a, to me, that's a, that's a difficult question and it maybe shows uh, the limits of what we know um, about this time period. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Mm -hmm. So we have a, um, a few more questions coming in and uh, I'll, I'll ask you one that's come from the chat and then um, I saw a hand up from Abdel Rahman Mustafa also, which uh, we'll come to in a second. Um, so uh, Marty Toyan asks, uh, what were the approximate time periods when each revision was written? And also, would you consider these revisions to be more grammatical uh, corrections uh, versus more radical uh, revisions? Okay, uh, thank you, Martin, for the question. Um, so the approximate time periods, there is um, a wide range of time periods um, with the um, just the versions that, that we talked about today. Um, Deuteronomy and the priestly text and the Pentateuch, those are hard to put exact dates on, um, but something like uh, six or 700 BCE, so 2,600, 2,700 years ago. Um, and then Jubilees in the Temple Scroll are something like 2,200 years ago. Um, and then these um, different texts of the Pentateuch, what we call pre Samaritan and Proto Masoretic, those are coming from the same time period, just over. 2000 years ago. Um, and in terms of grammatical corrections versus more radical revision, um, in terms of formally how much is being changed, um, the, some of the earlier ones uh, are more radical. Um, Deuteronomy and the priestly text both seem to be very free with how they're telling the story. Um, the Temple Scroll and Jubilees they're reusing existing material. So almost everything in the Temple Scroll and in Jubilees comes from the, the Torah or from other existing texts, but they're still very uh, flexible with how they use it. Um, and then with these Masoretic and Samaritan texts, again, formally they're copying existing manuscripts of Genesis, Exodus, et cetera, um, and copying them for the most part, word for word, but even relatively small changes like changing um, changing from the place that your God has chosen to the place your God will choose. Just that uh, change in uh, time reference can have a huge impact um, ideologically. Um, so so I, I would say that all of these are pretty potent in terms of how much of an effect they can have on the meaning, but some of them uh, are very free with how they retell it. And some of them are more circumscribed and try to use a light touch, but still have a big uh, effect. Interesting, right? So the, uh, even what we would consider a, a, a minor change of a letter here or there actually could have a huge, huge uh, implications. Um, mm -hmm. Abdul Rahman, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, I wasn't able to put my question in chat because I'm, I'm driving to the masjid. And um, as a Muslim, we have like a, a whole scenario of story of uh, the golden calf. However, I want to uh, understand the perspective of the prophet Aaron uh, uh, from a Jewish point of view. And this is because I and my friend, uh, Dennis, we may uh, don't share the same agreement on the character of uh, the prophet Aaron. Um, so I want to hear uh, the Jewish perspective on that. I heard you say after they built the calf, the golden calf, the uh, prophet Aaron told them, let's celebrate to Yahweh. Mm -hmm. um, this is uh, one question. Uh, so please go ahead. And I, I may ask another question afterwards, if you don't mind. Okay. Uh, okay. Go ahead, Kevin. 
Yeah, thank you. So, so um, yeah, so when uh, while Moses is busy up on the mountain, um, waiting for God to give him the tablets, uh, or maybe if we if we believe uh, Jubilees, uh, having an additional revelation dictated to him while he's waiting for the tablets, um, Aaron is kind of left in charge, and um, whereas Moses. Uh, is able to keep the people in line generally, right? Uh, um, although he has issues later, um, things quickly fall apart, and um, Aaron seems to be put in this position um, where he builds the golden calf, even though he doesn't want to. Um, and so he knows, in some sense, he knows that it's wrong, um, and um, blames the you know he blames the Israelites for for kind of forcing this on him. Um, but, um, this is, there's, there's kind of a, uh, symmetry or a poetry to this that, um, when God gives the laws to Moses, even before he says, um, build me an altar, he says, don't build me a statue of gold or silver. And so the very first command of this covenant law, um, so, um, God gives this law. The first thing he says is don't build, don't make statues of gold and silver. And then um, the Israelites agree to this law. And then immediately um, the first thing they do is break the very first law. Um, and so that's something that kind of um, sets the tone for the story. Um, and um, also something that Deuteronomy is going to pick up on because Moses is going to argue um, You'd be dead if it weren't for me, right? Because Moses intercedes to save the people. Um, I am the only thing standing between you and destruction, and I'm not going to be here anymore. So listen to me. Go on and on for chapter after chapter of advice, um, because this is my last chance to get you um, to do things right so that God doesn't kill you and I'm not here to stop him anymore. So that's basically, to me, the the, the upshot of the Golden Calf episode as it's told in um, in the Torah. Great, thank you. Abdel Rahman, do you want to ask one, one more question? Go ahead. Okay. Um, since you talk about uh, 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 not building a statue for God, uh, golden ore or silver, um, we do have the same thing, but uh, like I find it, uh, like I didn't get it. How come uh, the Ark has uh, uh, the description of a gold, uh, a golden statue, kind of, if I'm not, <laughs> if I'm understanding the correct way, and at the same time, God is telling them not to. I find this kind of contradictive. Yeah. How do you explain this to me, please? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I I find it kind of contradictory too, um, and uh, that's a great example of we have these different versions of the origin story, and they don't have to. They often don't agree. Um, and so this Horeb story that we started with today talks about don't build statues of gold and silver, and then the Israelites do, and they're punished for it. And the priestly version of Israel's origin story is totally different. In that version of the story, um, God doesn't want a simple dirt or stone altar. Um, he wants this very elaborate, ornate um, bronze altar and a golden incense altar and a golden um ark with golden cherubim on it. And so all of that ornamentation is there because the priestly authors have a different conception of, uh, of, of what God wants and how um, they relate to their God. And it's a much more um, sophisticated and, and, and complicated system in general that that the ark is at the center of versus this very simple, um, you know, anyone can, anyone can pile up some dirt and offer a simple animal sacrifice. Um, and in fact, Moses does this all by himself um, to, to complete the covenant. He builds an altar all by himself, and then he makes an off makes offerings. Um, but in that priestly conception, you can't do that. You need this whole apparatus. Um, and if you even uh, want to bring your sacrifice in to the tabernacle so the priests can um, take care of that for you, you've got to be purified first, right? So there are all these barriers. It's Everything is much more uh, organized. Um, and 
Um, it's just a totally different system. And they kind of even even when they're combined in the, in in the book of Exodus and so on, there's not there doesn't seem to be much effort made to make them fit together. It's just here's one system, here's another, and you figure it out. Um, it's left as an exercise to the reader, um, and people have been trying to figure it out ever since. And that's why we get jubilees. That's why we get things. Um, this is why we um, we have continuing interpretation of these texts even until today. Interesting. I think your I think your notion of retellings is is also a very good explanation for how to reconcile these contradictions, right? If it's sometimes it changes uh, mm -hmm. in the retellings. Um, so if it's okay with you, we'll take we'll take one more question um, that sure. came in through the through the chat. Um, this comes from um, Rick, who's who asks, um, can you comment on the treatment of the notion of chosenness, uh, the chosenness of of Israel through the various narratives. Yeah, um, sure. So, so the, um, the, the theme of the chosenness of Israel is um, something that is, um, in a, at least in a basic way, is common to all of these. And this is, this is uh, something, something that happens at Sinai is that Israel is officially chosen by this particular God uh, at that time. And in some cases, that may mean they've been chosen from the beginning, and God here is making it official or reaffirming it, uh, or it may be, you know, this is something new that's happening, um, or somewhere in between. Um, in, but um, that's a very basic similarity that I think is true um, of all these different um, depictions. But the, the way in which Israel is chosen um, and exactly what that means can be very uh, can be very different still. And so, um, for example, there are different extents of inclusion of non-Israelites. Um, are, are things like the Sabbath observed by Israelites only or by Israelites and anyone who's living in the land of Israel? Um, even by their their slaves and their livestock, but also by foreigners who who just live there. Um, same thing with certain sacrifices being required of non-Israelites or or being something that's only for Israelites. Um, and uh, again, I, I mentioned already this this growing um, use of circumcision as an identity marker in later times, and um, that's something that. Um, leads to uh, Jubilees has to um, rethink Israel's chosenness. And one way that they do that is they essentially, um, they, they really, they, they play up the, the importance of circumcising on the eighth day. And what that does is effectively makes conversion impossible. Um, and so some of you may know there's this story in the book of Genesis where um, this local, this um, Canaanite, we'll say Shechemite, this uh, who lives in the land of Canaan wants to marry Jacob's daughter. And um, the family says, you can marry her, but you have to be circumcised first. Um, and they end up using that to, um, to uh, trick this guy and all the men of his town into circumcising themselves so that they can more easily murder them. And it's this, this very grisly uh, um, trick that they play on them. But, um, Jubilees works to remove that from consideration. Um, you can't just circumcise later in life and become a part of the group. It's something that you have to be born into. And so it's not, it's no longer a way of incorporating new people. And so that to me is it a way in which for, for Jubilees, Israel's chosenness is more, maybe more uh, absolute and, they, and they're not uh, accepting um, anyone uh, coming into this chosen this. Interesting. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Kevin, for a really fascinating uh, lecture and a really um, stimulating discussion and Q&A session. Uh, thank you all for, for being here this evening. Please join me in a virtual round of, round of applause. Uh, and um, I will I will stop the recording in a moment, and if anyone wants to uh, unmute and say hello, please feel free. But uh, 
thank you so much for, for being here. And um, we'll invite you to join us next week on uh, Thursday, November 3rd for uh, the lecture by Professor uh, Amy Weiss on Passports for Palestine, Forged Travel Documents and American Volunteers in Israel's War of Independence, or on November 10th uh, for Daniel Green's uh, Kristallnacht lecture on Thursday, November 10th. So thank you again, and uh, we look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thanks, Kevin. Okay, thank you.